This report of the 1978 Mr. Olympia comes from the December 1978 issue of Muscle Digest magazine. The title says, The Olympia Report that Frank Zane, what a lucky guy. The 1978 Mr. Olympia contest was without a doubt the greatest bodybuilding spectacle that I have ever seen. The atmosphere was electric. Everywhere, everyone was full of anticipation. There was so much movement from the fan in his seat, nervously shifting weight to the rent -a cop keeping would-be photogs from disrupting the backstage area. The orchestra pit was teeming with media types. The local papers, ABC camera crew, some even from Austria, the various bodybuilding mags, etc. All expectant, some praying, a few staring blankly, energies already drained, needing the revitalization of the fight ahead. It was a packed house. If it had rafters, there would have been still more seats sold. It was also a repeat performance for the master of today's techniques, today's politics, today's psychology. It was the second year of Zane. Muscle Digest was heavily involved in this contest, and apart from a few behind-the-scenes disturbances, all went smoothly and fairly. There were complaints about crust passes and the relative location each in the media assumed. Some of the competitors did not like their lack of privacy. And an alleged altercation between Bill Grant and Arnold Schwarzenegger was brought to a close when Cal Scalac stepped in as a peacemaker. There were the usual cries of biased officiating from some of the competitors immediately upon hearing the judge's decision. But those same competitors put all that behind them at the post-Olympia party and were seen discoing just as avidly as those who had won. In the heat of the battle, it's easy to lose one's composure, so let's not judge too harshly or think too long about those who became emotional. All in all, this contest was simply outstanding, and so it should have been, for the Olympia rests comfortably as bodybuilding's premier event. Never in my life have I heard such a series of thunderous ovations. The crowd had waited a full year for the return of Arnold and his crew, the physiques, the stage presentation. They weren't disappointed, and they weren't afraid to let everyone else know either. In a year where there has been turmoil of one kind or another at almost every contest, this was a breath of fresh air. This will be a tough act to follow as, again, Schwarzenegger, Lorimer, and the city of Columbus host the 1979 Mr. Olympia. The Olympia competitors, Frank Zane, built like a fine precision watch. He's not a bodybuilder. He's got a great body, but there's no meat to him. You've got to have size to be a bodybuilder. I couldn't believe his skin. It didn't look real. It was so perfect. And that sheen, it was fantastic. These were just some of the comments that Frank elicited by his showing. It seems funny to me. So many think it'll be easy to knock Frank off. Then at the actual showdown, he once again emerged as Victor. It's probably because he's somewhat slight, delicate almost, that his beefier foes evince such confidence. But it is this meticulous, untiring attention to detail that makes him a winner. The other men at this contest were athletes, sportsmen, or devotees of an art form. Frank is a businessman. He is a true bodybuilding professional. He does not engage in excess, rather he calculates. No 400 pound bench presses, no 500 pound squats. He does just what is needed. No more, or no less. And with this formula, he wins. Robbie Robinson. On the plane coming from the West Coast, Robbie was hit by a bacterial infection and had to take oxygen. He very nearly decided not to compete. His temperature rose to such an extreme point that he began to lose body hair. Despite his wife, Elaine, asking him to back off, his fighting spirit prevailed. It was a tired Robbie that was on stage that night. With all the prejudging excitement, you could find him sitting on the stairs out of the way of admirers and competitors alike. He was trying to summon the last of his reserves for the tasks to come. Once on stage, there was little that was obviously wrong with his performance. He lacked the pizzazz of the old Robbie, but even if there had been nothing wrong, it would have taken a remarkable man to have dethroned Zane. His friend and Muscle Digest photographer, Joe Valdez, relates this story. Said Joe, well, Robbie, it was the same as last year. You won your weight class, but Zane beat you for the overall. Robbie, yeah, Joe, that Frank Zane, two years in a row. What a lucky guy. I'm happy for him. His tone was not sarcastic. Lucky did not refer to a gift. He was genuinely happy for another's good fortune. And in that displayed a lot of class. This sport needs more people with that kind of generous attitude. Roy Callender, big, black, immense. Wouldn't want to meet him in a dark alley. This is the sort of feeling that I had just looking at his pictures. 
He sort of broods facially. In point of fact, he was very warm and considerate. I had a laugh when Roy, doing tricep press downs on one side of the universal machine, started to sing to Robbie, who was on the other side. Every time I see your face, it reminds me of places we used to go, etc. Robbie, serious and trying to concentrate with the new job at hand, just broke up with laughter. Oh, stop that stuff, Roy. With all the nerves and hassles, here was this guy having a good time. We don't see enough of this kind of thing. Laughter should return to competition. One thing's certain, with Roy around, you don't dare take yourself too seriously. Boyer Co. I'd seen most of it before. The split bicep, heavily muscled upper back, tapering to a tiny midsection, huge thighs and wildly flaring calves. For sure, it was impressive. But what I was totally unprepared for was Boyer's ab shot. Do you comprehend? Boyer threw his arms upwards, elbows pointing straight to the ceiling, and crunch from a total co-vacuum to an abdominal pose. The crowd went nuts. How long has Boyer suffered criticism for his lack of stomach development? Well, now he had momentum. For a while, it looked as though he would prevail, at least in the crowd's attitudes toward the competitors, if not the judges. Boyer, stage-wise and ever alert to the changes of the audience, played it for all it was worth. Continued improvement will surely reap higher placings and fan support. With a good set of abs, Boyer will be tough next year. Cal Scalak. Was he dumped? Many of his fans thought so. How could the hero of the 76 Cal, 76 America, and 77 Universe place fifth in the 78 Olympia? Well, let me answer it like this. First came John Grimmick, then Steve Reeves. After Reeves came Reg Park, Bill Pearl, Larry Scott, Sergio Oliva, the incomparable Arnold Schwarzenegger. Finally, now comes Frank Zane. Each of the men I've named took our sport and did something with it. They were high watermarks of their time. Scalak would have done much better in competition with Pearl or Leva or even Schwarzenegger than he did with Zane. For here we are dealing with types, body types. It is a genre, fashion. What do you do if you are out of style? You create the demand. You don't complain about the public or judge's lack of taste or competence. You create your own demand. Scalak will undoubtedly reach the top if only he pays attention to the lessons of history. Witness the exhibitions of both Scott and Pearl. They weren't the bodies of old, but they damn sure weren't phony reproductions either. These men did exactly what they were supposed to do. They posed in a way that made each famous. Did Pearl do a crab? No. Did Scott throw Sergio's famous arms overhead pose? No. Both performed exactly as expected. The fans paid for nothing less. Skullak has some of the most remarkable arms in bodybuilding. His chest and back are very heavily muscled with separation in the extreme. Back off for just a moment, Cal. You are too impetuous. It takes time to create a style. But once you have paid the price, you will reap long-term dividends from your work. You don't want to be a flash in the pan. You want to contribute something. Leave a memory of your presence. Hit the new heights that your potential indicates. You have to just refine your act and wait. Your time is coming. Dan Padilla. Pound for pound, there was no one in this contest that was any more muscled than Danny. In a way, it's too bad that almost everything in our life has to be measured. For when you place a tall competitor next to a shorter one, most of the time, the shorter man loses. Danny was a little smooth this time around, but apart from Zane, he was the most symmetrical. He's an improving poser and seems to enjoy his performance. This is a very necessary aspect of competition. You must look more than competent. You must be confident, poised, alert, and genuinely glad to be up there. In short, you must have the look of a winner. Danny presents the image that is needed. It's also nice to think that his onstage image is internally felt. There was a competitor in the international part of the competition who idolized Danny. He spoke very little English and was somewhat shy about approaching his idol. He wanted to buy the jacket from Danny's warm-up suit. Danny did not have another wrap, and he wouldn't sell it anyway. He simply approached this man with an open hand, and his jacket is a gift. Now that is gracious. True class. How many others would have acted so unselfishly? By his actions, Danny made a new friend, enhanced his own reputation, and gave this young athlete a thrill that he will remember for a long time to come. Ed Corning. Butler and Gaines have helped immortalize Ed Corning. The cover of Pumping Iron has been turned into a standard pose for Ed. The fact that he's among the top two or three posers in the world does not hurt his reputation with the crowd. Even when he misses getting into and holding top condition until contest time, he remains a classic. A legend in his own time a performer who lives in our memories 
and one whom we are willing to forgive if he is less than expected. We always sort of need a strong runner, someone you can identify with, someone with whom your personality may safely project, someone who gives 100% every time out. The contest was very close and Ed failed to place in the top six. It was hard for all who were there. It must have been very hard for Corny. We can only hope that he will return. Tony Emmett, I knew when looking at the complete lineup that Tony would not win. But standing up there, I was hard pressed to make the judgment about how he could improve himself. Part by part, his body was one of the most flowing. He lacked a little tan, and since he was not on his home turf, appeared a little more uneasy than the rest. His obliques are very well developed, along the lines of a Clint Burrell or a Pat Neve. Personally, I don't like them that much. It's a matter of taste. What can you say to someone who comes in dead last in a sprint when the winner is pushed to a world record time? This is essentially the case that we have here. Tony didn't look bad, he just didn't win. He was great in a slightly greater field. As a matter of fact, Bill Pearl had him in fourth place, ahead of both Boyer Co. and Cal Scalac. Since he isn't crying the blues, I won't either. Tony will be around to mix it up next year. You can be sure of that. Dennis Tinarino. Dennis's family sticks by him through thick and thin. After hearing the judge's verdict, his father, Conmine, declared, I'm going to call out the Justice Department. That's some dad you got there, Dennis. Sure, it's hard to take a loss, especially in the battle was so hotly fought. Dennis was in the best shape of his life. Everyone that I heard comment said so. His thighs were more ripped than they've been in quite some time. His arms and chest were both very good. His waist was tight. But for areas needing improvement, I would look to both taper from the rear as well as lower back. His calves were good, but not outstanding. Pass possibly he could use more size. But you must realize I'm talking about small areas. There wasn't a single man in this competition who was obviously outclassed. As his father said after cooling down, he's only been training hard for the last year. He's had quite a layoff. Just wait till next year. Carmine, I agree. Roger Walker. Roger was a bit too smooth for the strict criteria the judges were forced to draw upon. He was either overfed or retained too much fluid. A large growing number of men are now severely restricting their intake of fluids prior to competition. This helps rid the bloat that is steroid induced. Although this markedly improves one's appearance, the balance of electrolytes is shot. When this happens, neural or nerve transmission slows, fatigue and cramping begins. But this is the life in the big city. If you decide to play the game, then you should resign yourself to the rules that bind all members in that game. My criticism of Roger is a gentle one. He needs to cut up his physique more than any other thing. He has more than enough size. He is handsome. He seems congenial. Final word, diet. Mohammed Makawi. I had the same first impression about meeting Mohammed that I had when I met Serge Nubre. Both have bone structures that seem more cat-like than human. The word is sleek. I'm reminded of that great wide receiver, Paul Warfield. If you've ever seen him run, then you know what I'm saying. Mohammed's mother might have been from Earth, but his father was undoubtedly a superior being from outer space. It's the fineness of line, the quality of strength whose integrity of structure depends upon exact dimension. Like the Ferrari that won't run at all if a bit out of tune, but thunders past all others when everything's okay. This is Makawe. Unfortunately, on this particular night, all was not well. The timing was just slightly off. Of all the physiques up on stage that night, I would have rather traded structures with this man than any other. He's that good. True, Muhammad is not as thick as Padilla. He lacks rib cage. But then a cheetah is not as husky as a lion either. I guess that is his sort of physique that would be easy to live with. For when he drops weight, he becomes a smaller version of himself, while Arnold becomes another sort of person altogether. What can I say? The man has most of the genetic features that make a top competitor. Now all he has to do is utilize his potential. Al Beckles. Here is a man with gobs of back and bicep. In the dressing room, he shared quarters with Roy Callender. It was there when I had my first face-to-face -face encounter with the West Indian. He's not the type to take interruptions gracefully. He made me feel as uncomfortable as my probing made him. Calendar was just the opposite. His manner was much more easy. Probably the difference in attitude lies in the fact that some people handle pressure better than others. The fans were not as supportive of Al as they were of some of the other men, and I suppose that to one degree or another, this too would make a difference. But first or last, everyone in the Olympia deserves our respect. Bill Grant. This guy is a real ham. He enjoys the stage and the attention at least as much as all the others put together. 
His girlfriend, Kathy, occupied a front center position and kept shouting, that's it, Bill, you can do it. Wow, check out those arms. Ooh, look at that back. She was really getting into it. Support in the extreme. It must have made Bill feel special. I know that those around her enjoyed her exuberance. But getting down to it, Bill was not as sharp as I've seen him in the past. And those calves, a travesty. If Boyer Cole can do something about his previously non-existent midsection, then you should be able to do something about those lower legs. There's no excuse for not working them to the max. Robbie has high calves. Jim Morris has high calves. Roy Callender has high calves. Al Beckel has high calves. So get it going. 